Well, the Bible has plenty to say about anger because, unfortunately, it's a reality of our fallen sin nature. Now, I'm looking out and I'm seeing some of you that I can't imagine ever being angry, but just because you are who you are and we came from where we came from, everyone's got some anger in them. Anger's bad. We know that. Uh, I don't have to read you a single scripture. You would just automatically say it's bad to be angry. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as James, half-brother of Jesus, said, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Why? Because the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. James 1, 19 and 20. Anger is foolish. Anger is outrageous. Anger breaks down. And anger is punished. I'll read some Verses to back that statement up from the Proverbs, primarily Proverbs 14, 17. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. Proverbs 27, 4. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. Proverbs 25, 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. 29, verse 22, an angry man stirreth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. 1919, a man of great wrath shall suffer punishment. So how are we supposed to deal with anger? It's to be slowed down, a lot of verses on that, and deferred. It's to be put off and put away and replaced with forgiveness and charity and, and peace. A lot of these, uh, again, from the Proverbs. Proverbs 14, 29, He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Uh, 15 and verse 18, A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. And then we jump over to Ecclesiastes, still the preacher Ecclesiastes 7, 9, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Back in Proverbs 19, 11, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his, is his glory to pass over a transgression. We get into the New Testament, Colossians 3, 8, But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, Malice goes on from there. Ephesians 4, somewhat parallel passage, verse 31, 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That should sound a little familiar. Now from Sunday night, 1 Peter 4 and verse 8, And above all these things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And Romans 12, 18, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. But isn't there an out? <laughs> Can't I go to Jesus preaching in the Sermon on the Mount? And does he, doesn't he say something about, if there's a good cause, I can be angry? Well, kind of, <laughs> sort of. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount, verse 21 and 22, Jesus said, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And we would have maybe an inclination to grab hold of that and say, see, <laughs> I can be angry with the brother as long as there's a cause. And doesn't God himself get angry? Do we have anywhere in the scriptures where that's stated? Uh, Book of Judges, for example, four times. We have the exact same phrase, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. What about Jesus Christ? Can you picture in your mind, from your knowledge of the scriptures, any time that he 
seemingly went on an angry rage. The, the word anger is not there, but the picture that's painted two different times that he went into the temple. At the beginning, uh, more towards the beginning of his earthly ministry, and, and really a, a same scenario towards the end. At the beginning in, in John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changer's money and overthrew the tables. It'd be hard to, to say just right there, well, he wasn't angry. He was just tidying things up. No, he overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And that's, uh, that's quoting from the Psalms. So isn't there a time for righteous indignation against sin? You might say, I believe you gave us maybe a biblical out there. But let me ask this question. What about anger against a righteous God who knows no sin? Well, that's a horse of a different color. It's like, well, my out is if there's a cause against a brother, righteous indignation, but what if there is no unrighteousness? What if I'm mad at God? Are there any places in the scriptures that show us a man mad at God? What would be the very first reference of that? And you'd say, well, the book of beginnings, probably in, in Genesis, yep. The very first son of Adam was angry at God. The first case of man being angry at God is the firstborn man. And what was the reason? God wouldn't accept his, we would somewhat apply it and, and uh, understand it to mean a works-based salvation. Uh, Genesis chapter 4, you've been listening to me read, why don't you... Make sure your fingers work. Turn to Genesis chapter 4. I'll read a few verses here. The first man that was angry at God, at least explicitly stated so. Now someone's going to say, well, I'm going to go and prove that Adam was <laughs> mad at God. Well, let's look at this son of, son of Adam. Verse 3 of chapter 4, the book of Genesis. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Again, the real reason for the scenario here is his father had sinned, requiring that blood be shed. Without shedding of blood is no remission. We read in, in the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 9 and, and verse 22. He should have been mad at Dad. I mean, if he's going to be mad at anyone, why not the one that brought sin into the world and, and messed everything up? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. This is your dad, Cain. And death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5 and, and verse 12. He should have been mad at Dad. Instead, he was angry at God. The one who did something about the sin that came into the world. And the Lord attempted dialogue with Cain asked him some questions, some teaching questions, some rhetorical questions, trying to jog his memory, something he likely already knew, 
that without shedding of blood is, is no remission. He got angry at God. God tried to dialogue with him, and instead of responding to God, talking to him, God talked to his brother Abel. Verse 8 says, And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And that didn't work out so well. It came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Instead of working out his anger with God, he redirected his anger towards one that God favored. Well, what about, what about you? What about me? As a child of Adam as well, are you ever mad at God? And we sang, look and live, and I don't know if you pay any attention to the top of the hymn book where it gives you a little scripture reference that, that ties into the hymn. The one for that song was Isaiah 45 and verse 22. And go ahead and turn there so you're not just staring at me. You can look down in your, your Bible. Here's a pop quiz. Isaiah 45 verse 22. Who came to call upon the Lord because of the preaching of this scripture? It was a stormy night, uh, I think uh, winter, over in England. A young man couldn't get to his normal church. He just saw a church. He just wanted to seek refuge. He stumbled in there. The preacher of that church couldn't make it because of the weather. One of the laymen stood up and just read this verse and, and preached about 10, 15 minutes expounding on it. And, and then looked at that young teenager and called him out right there in the, in the middle of the preaching and told him he needed to be saved. I see some Spurgeon, Charles Haddon, had it something, H, <laughs> Spurgeon. Uh, Isaiah 45, verse 22, I'll read to, to 24. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come. And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. The lost, you would say, at least we wouldn't say they necessarily have a right to be angry with God, but we can understand perhaps why they would shake their fist at God, be angry, be incensed. They don't want to humble themselves uh, before Almighty God, and acknowledge their, their sin. Refusing to be saved, refusing to humbly look and live, they will be ashamed. And they will be forced eventually to bow the knee and swear with their tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And uh, we would be familiar with Paul being moved to the Spirit to quote from that passage as he wrote to the church in Philippi, Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. But what about the, the saved? Do the saved get angry? Do the saved ever get incensed against God after salvation? We started with Cain, and you'd say, well, Cain was a lost man. How do you know that? Well, <laughs> You need to be saved by the blood. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. And his brother brought the blood, and he brought just the works of his hands. So we could write him off and say he was just incensed at God because he was lost. He refused to follow God's plan of salvation. Can you think of anyone else in the scriptures that was angry at God that we would say, ah, it was wrong that he was angry at God, but, but he was a saved man. Doest thou well to be angry? Jonah? 
first we need to, I guess, clarify and, and convince ourselves scripturally that Jonah was a saved man. You might say, he was mad at God, he was lost. God used a lost man to cause revival with his preaching. All those people in, in Nineveh. Prove to me, I dare you, prove to me that Jonah was a saved man. No one's saying that, but if you did, here's how I would respond. Uh, Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2, he's referencing Nineveh, the, the wicked Ninevites of the, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Well, why did he hate them so much? Why was he so angry at God that God shined his grace a, a, upon them? Well, historically, maybe you've heard accounts of what they would do with their, uh, the bodies of their enemies, cut off the heads, put them on poles and line the streets going into uh, the capital. So Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, he's, he's referencing Nineveh, but think about what he's saying. I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. How would he know that? <laughs> I heard it. I was walking down the street and someone told me, <laughs> told me that. No, he said, I knew that thou art a gracious God. How would he know that? I knew that thou art merciful. How would he know that? I knew that you're slow to anger and of great kindness. <laughs> Perhaps because he experienced it personally. Uh, I believe that that in and of itself shows a pretty intimate knowledge of the, the grace of God, I believe by personal experience, I would uh, perhaps add to that the Lord Jesus Christ referenced Jonah as, as the sign that of his res own resurrection. <laughs> and, uh, and I would be uh, quizzical if God saw fit to, in addition to the preaching that caused so many to repent and be saved in this entire wicked city, and in addition to, to claiming he personally knew that of God's grace and mercy and kindness, uh, it would seem odd that God would use a lost person to demonstrate the Jesus Christ coming up out of, out of the grave in the, in the power of, of the resurrection. So uh, I'm convinced that Jonah was, was a saved man, and uh, he was angry at God, Okay, so it's okay to be angry at God. No, God called him out on it and, and questioned him on it uh, repeatedly throughout the book, especially, specifically a couple times there in, in chapter 4. And, and we'll come back to that. What about David? Just thinking of some others we read about in the scriptures. I don't have to convince you David was a saved man. He was a man after God's own heart. Do we have verse after verse of, uh, in the scriptures of, of, of the Holy Spirit causing men to write? And here, David was just furious with God. Not necessarily, but as we read through the songs, and he's singing out his emotions and feelings in the predicaments that he finds himself in and the enemies that are attacking, he starts certainly to question God. And as he questions is there not at least a, a, a tinge of anger in God? I'm asking you these questions because I want answers because you don't seem to be out there at this moment in, in my life. The beginning of Psalm 13. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? The beginning of Psalm 22. We, we immediately go to, to Calvary in the words of Jesus Christ from the cross. But it, the words were first written down by David from his own experiences. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Now, I wouldn't go to the cross and say, Jesus in saying those words was angry at his heavenly father. Certainly, passion and emotion that uh, we might not ever to be able to fully comprehend. But David mouthed those same words, perhaps with some anger, certainly some uh, misunderstanding at the isolation he was feeling. 
back in his time. And so what about you, again, child of, of God? Uh, some more than others, perhaps, have experienced some uh, awful tribulations in your life, some horrific suffering and sorrow allowed somehow by a loving God, a loving Heavenly Father. And maybe at such a time in your life you've found yourself mad at God. And you find yourself uh, or found yourself at uh, a crossroads, a fork in the road, and, there, and you're angry at God and there's two ways you could, you could handle it. One is just to be mad at him, more mad, not shake free from it. And then you think, but wait a minute, when someone was, uh, when a child of God was mad at God in the scriptures, God called him out and said, doest thou well to be angry? And so I'm angry. And it's as if those words are ringing in my ear, doest thou well to be angry? But I am angry, doest thou well? And this, uh, and maybe this endless do loop that causes a feeling of guilt and shame. And instead of talking it out with God, you don't feel like asking those questions that maybe David did or even Jonah or others in, in the scripture. So instead of saying, God, I'm angry, what, why is this going on in my life? You just have diminished dialogue. You talk to him less and less. You listen to him less and less. Well, that doesn't help. It just brings despair, depression, and in that state, angry, feeling guilty and full of shame, not talking to God, not listening to God, depressed and in despair. Are you really of any use to God at that point? Is there much, if anything, that, that God can do with you in service to him? Paul was terrified that he would be a, a castaway, cast away, not in salvation, but just cast away once and for all, set on a shelf from the ser for the service of the Lord. Well, that's one path you could go down. There's, a, there's another path. Still tribulation, still horrible, awful things perhaps in your life. But you could allow the Lord to work those out onto patience, a, an endurance through it all gaining experience and seeing the Lord prove himself trustworthy again and again and again. So tribulations not leading to anger and guilt and shame and those other things, but tribulations leading to patience and experience and from experience hope. And in that state, based on what you've gone through and the path you chose to let it take you down, you are still of service to the Lord, perhaps in an even greater manner. The uh, end of Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 4, really chapter 4 is about imputation, the reckoning of the righteousness of God to someone else's account, to your account, in this case Abraham's account, by faith. Let me pick up in verse 20, really so that we understand how the end of chapter 4 leads into chapter 5. Book of Romans. So verse 20, chapter 4, book of Romans, he, speaking of Abraham, staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. It was written down in the balance of, of, of his account. God's righteousness reckoned unto Abraham. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Here's the resurrection, again, Jonah being used as a picture of the resurrection. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Totally guilty, but being able to walk free just as if I'd not sinned at all. So this 
imputation, the reckoning of Christ's righteousness to our account by, by faith unto our salvation, our, through our faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, unto our justification. Because of that, therefore, we roll into chapter 5. Chapter 5, therefore, because of imputation, we can have peace with God through Christ and hope of the, the glory of, of God in tribulations as opposed to getting angry with God. And this is uh, obviously a, a topical as opposed to a, a textual message, but I do want to read a good portion here of chapter 5 of Romans. We'll stop at, at verse 11. Now, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. So put it in the context of the therefore, pointing us back to the imputation of chapter 4, and then pay attention for the tribulations that are mentioned and the pathway that can be chosen when those tribulations come. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And again, hope is, is not wishful thinking. It's a confident expectation. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation makes me just angry at God. <laughs> That's obviously not what it says. That's just what we sometimes do. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Go back to Isaiah 45 that we read, the, the passage uh, where Spurgeon was saved when he heard it preached. Those that were incensed, furious, angry at God would be ashamed. But here, taking tribulation, uh, tribulations in another direction, instead of being incensed, instead of being angry at God here, the, leading up to hope that maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It seems like throughout this I, I need to keep pausing and saying this is what we forget when tribulations come and we get angry at God. Uh, oh yeah that I'm a miserable sinner that, that he died for. And uh, he, he commendeth his love toward me while I was that miserable sinner. Uh, much more than being now justified by his blood. Now that's what Cain got wrong, as opposed to Abel. Justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And that is, we kind of learn it as at one mint, and that's that reconciliation with God after being at enmity with him. Uh, what a wonderful passage for anchoring our thoughts in times of tribulation. Pastor Geist, but what if something really horrible happened to me? And I remembered to go and read this passage of scripture and I was still angry at God. Well, then I would look out from the pulpit and preach, just stop it. And you would say, thanks, that doesn't really help. So I would say this, when you're angry with God, 
don't <laughs> stop talking to him. Don't stop talking to him. I'm not going to say, just stop it. Don't be angry. The goal is to work away from that anger, recognizing it's wrong. But don't double down on being wrong by then turning away and stop, stop talking to him and find, finding someone else to redirect your anger at that has nothing to do with it. Okay, I'm angry with God. I don't want to be. Just don't stop talking to him. And asking him questions, telling him how you feel, asking him why things are so, listening to what he says in response, listening then to the questions he has for you. And not just walking away at that point, but saying, hmm, I haven't thought of that. God never asks us questions that he doesn't already know the answers. Uh, so he's not asking for his benefit to be cued in on something. He's asking as a learning point for us. So ask him questions and listen to what he has to say and then listen to his questions back, not to tell him the answer, but to learn what he wants you to learn in asking the question. Just don't diminish your dialogue with him. Calling out to him in prayer, you don't have to uh, bend the knee a certain way and fold your hands a certain way and say, okay, this, I, I remember this is how I'm supposed to pray. You're angry. <laughs> Just talk. Just speak to your heavenly father and listen. Tribulations should work towards the hope of the glory of God and not anger at God and shame and withdrawal. And in order to examine some of the right and wrong actions, kind of centered around that, that central thought, uh, when we're mad at God, let's see how Cain handled it again. Just briefly go back and look at him. We'll look at Jonah and we'll look at David. I have one bad example what not to do, one good example what to do, and one that maybe is left kind of in the middle, and you'd say, I don't know, I'm two against one, two bad, one good, Cain, eh, Jonah, he gets called out by God, eh, where are you getting the half? Well, we'll, we'll see that. Uh, but before we run through those real, real briefly, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, James, he, he said a similar thought that Paul wrote to the Romans there at the beginning of chapter 5 of Romans, James, right at the beginning of his letter, boom, right, right in the face. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. And maybe Josh is having some flashbacks however long ago when, when he just started teaching through the book of James. Uh, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. It certainly doesn't say get angry at God. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Different writer, same author. Uh, the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let, let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So the pattern here was temptations, maybe some uh, horrible things that come into life. But out of that, instead of getting angry at God, temptations leading to patience, leading to perfection, and that perfection is further defined back in Romans 5 as being experience and hope. So let's uh, look at a bad example, a good example, and one that maybe could have gone either way. Cain, again, didn't talk to God, but had his anger spilled over against another, his brother. I'll not read that uh, passage again, other than just to point out verse 8, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, as opposed to speaking back to God, who was trying to ex explain him, trying to communicate with him in his anger, and he just would have none of it. it. came to pass that they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and, and slew him. Again, the cause of his anger, Cain's anger at God, that he wasn't able to curry favor or gain respect from God with his works. God said, here's the plan to have a relationship with me. No, I got my own plan. How about this? Look at I've worked hard. I've sweated uh, sweat of my brow to, to bring the fruits from the field, my labors. 
And he was mad that God said, no, that's, that's not the plan. And God's communication back with him. The Lord said unto Cain, that, uh, that's huge. I have that underline in verse 6. The Lord was trying to speak to Cain in Cain's anger. And the Lord was trying to reiter reiterate, look to the Lamb and, and, uh, and live. Look and live. Look to the Lamb of God. I guess look and live was uh, the fiery serpent. But here, look to the Lamb of God. And he reiterated for him to do that as opposed to trying to cover up his sin with his own works. And Cain didn't respond to God's clear pointing to his sin. And it, truth be known, if we're angry, angry at God, there's some aspect of that anger that is mad at the way God might be dealing with sin in our lives which makes us even more angry because our entering argument for being justified at being angry at God is, I did nothing wrong and look at this bad thing that happened to me. Well, that's a false premise from the get-go and so when God gently tries to point that out, it's gonna take a work of God to have a stop and listen as opposed to just get more angry and curl up our fists even more and finally just this isn't working. I'm just going to stop talking to him. I'm going to stop listening. I don't like the questions he's asking me. Well, like what? <laughs> if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted in this particular case? So he redirects. He stops talking to God, stops listening to God, redirects his anger and his communications with God towards the innocent. All of sin comes short of the glory of God, I understand that. But the one who brought an able offering, the right offering, the one God wanted, pointing to Jesus Christ. When you're angry at God, again, don't stop talking to him and don't stop listening to him. How do I talk to God? Pray. How do I hear from God? How do I listen to God? Bible, you know the answers, B-I-B-L-E. Preached word, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and, and, and the preaching is going to be from the written word, which you don't need to wait for a preacher to preach to you. you. You got it in your hands. You own one. You probably own multiple Bibles. Keep talking to God. Keep praying. Keep listening to God, as opposed to just letting your emotions rule. With the emotions ruling, as opposed to reading his words, what God is saying back to you, the emotions will simply keep you angry. So Cain, I think we can safely put in the negative column. And one of the things, again, I want to just keep reiterating. So if you blah, 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 you don't hear anything but one thing, don't stop communicating with God. And that was one of the biggest faults of, of Cain. Let's move on to Jonah. And it's interesting, his dialogue with God ended somewhat abruptly. And the, the book of Jonah has been preached from and preached through um, plenty of times here in this church or other churches uh, where you've been a, been a member through the years. And so you, you might, even in your mind, be thinking, you know, yeah, the last time I read through Jonah, you're going along, you're going along, and then it just, uh, it's like the brakes just have this screeching halt. <laughs> and... I already pointed out Jonah was a saved man. And not that I'm going to defend Jonah. There's so much that he did wrong. I want you to do this, Jonah. Okay, I'm going to run away the other, in the opposite direction because I don't want to do what you want me to do because I hate those people and you're going to save them and be gracious towards them and I don't want that because I'm angry at them and I'm going to be angry at you if you do that. So plenty of sin that, and we know that as we read through and listen to preaching from uh, the book of Jonah. But I will say this, when Jonah was angry at God, he didn't stop talking to God. He, there's a whole chapter, chapter 2, from the belly of the whale. What was he doing? He's talking. He's crying out to the Lord. He's praying uh, from, from the depths of the, the whale's belly. He said, it doesn't say whale, it says big fish in the new testament it says whale i can't remember where but I had a big a big debate with someone at the county fair when we had a booth there one year and we had a bible quiz it didn't say whale 
Anyway, from that big fish, he didn't stop. He didn't diminish his dialogue with God. He fervently called out to the Lord. And in chapter 4, there was somewhat of a dialogue that continued, but it displeased. Well, that's coming off of the end of chapter 3 where the city has this massive revival. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. But verse 2, and he prayed unto the Lord. And said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? And it continues on, not diminishing what he continues to say. We've already looked at part of it. But I simply want to point out again that he prayed. He was furious. He was angry at God. But he at least, I don't want to say vented. I mean, he kind of was venting, but, but he didn't stop talking. He didn't stop praying. And our prayers won't necessarily always be fluffy and nice and, Lord, everything's beautiful and sunshiny and cotton candy and puppy dog tails and I'm just happy and joyful. Sometimes, for Lord, I don't get this and I'm not going to stop talking to you. Just let me, <laughs> let me uh, talk this out. So he prayed. He prayed and he he asked questions, and he asked rhetorical questions. Didn't I tell you? And even in his anger, though, he, he's testifying of the good character and nature of the Lord that he knew personally. And maybe that's part of how God works you out of your anger at, at him if you're ever in that situation. You're starting off angry, and you're asking him questions, and before you know it, you're testifying to him of his good grace and his, his mercy and his love that he, I know that you're that way. How do I know that way? And that, that in and of itself might just stop you mid-prayer and say, oh yeah, because he showed that to me. And so he's angry and, and he, he talks to the Lord and, and God speaks back to him. Now then God spoke back to Jonah doest thou twice in chapter 4 doest thou well to be angry in verse 4 and I don't want to change the word of God but you determine is this sentiment in God's question doest thou well to be angry you're angry because I'm gracious that's it Jonah says, I'm mad at you. I personally knew of your grace. And God comes back, you're mad because I'm gracious? Or you're just mad because I not only showed you grace in bringing you back from the dead in the power of the resurrection, foreshadowing, but I want to share that unlimited grace. It's not like if I show grace to the wicked Ninevites that you hate, that I'm, I have to take a piece back that I gave you. I'm unbounded in all my attributes. I'm unbounded in my grace, my love, my mercy, my, my goodness, all that. That's why you're mad? No, he didn't say that. But I'm wondering if there's... <laughs> uh, it was in response to what Jonah said, and part of what Jonah said was, I knew you were gracious, and God says, doest thou well to be angry because of that? Oh, by the way, in his response, he also rejected... Jonah's death wish. And then we get down towards the end of the chapter. God said to uh, Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? Good timing. Got some gourd types of things down there in front of the pulpit. And again, you'd say, Well, Jonah, he's just a train wreck. He, he's still mad. He's still angry. Oh, briefly, he's happy because there's a little shade. And then now he's mad at God again because... The worm came and, and uh, ate up the, the leaves that were covering his head. But at least when God queried him, he kept responding. And he said, I do well. He didn't respond right, but he kept talking. I do well to be angry, even unto death. Again, he says, you know, my life is so miserable. I'm just so hot and thirsty and things aren't going right. Just take my life now. And the Lord uh, 
comes back and do us now well to be angry and should not I spare Nineveh? Final, final question we have there, and I'm having some dialogue there. Speaking of the cattle as well, I understand that. <laughs> we'll just focus on the souls of Nineveh. So he's finishing up with this, this question, should not I spare uh, Nineveh? And what is Jonah's response? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> we wouldn't say that the Holy Spirit forgot to finish the book as the author, the, the, the writer of this script in this account of history, purposely left silent Jonah's response. And maybe that's in part so you can fill it in with your response. You're the angry person. You, you haven't done what God's wanted you to do. You're mad at him about something, but you remembered, okay, at least keep talking to God. Yes, I am angry, and here's why, and, and why did you do this? And I knew you were like that, and so you would do that. And then when you go to catch a breath, God says, doest thou well to be angry? Yes, I do well to be angry. At least you kept talking. You listened to what he had to say. Maybe you didn't totally hear it, but you, you heard it, and there's dialogue going on. God continues to ask questions and says, should not I spare Nineveh? And what is, what is your response? And we don't know what Jonah's response was there. That's why I say, you know, he kept talking. Yes, he's a, he did a bunch of horrible things we can learn from. Don't do this. Don't do this like Jonah. Don't do this like Jonah. But I would say this. If you find yourself mad at God, incensed against God, you could follow Jonah in this. Keep talking to him. Keep talking to him. Keep praying. Keep listening to God's questions and going back and forth. You might find yourself all of a sudden acknowledging God's character and nature and then applying it to you, and then even going beyond that, realizing, well, everyone else does deserve that same God uh, and his grace that I got. Well, let's move on, finish up with David. Saved man, man after God's own heart, mightily used to the Lord, certainly had uh, sinful nature and did uh, plenty of things wrong in his life. But I just want to look at, a, uh, briefly, finishing up here at a, at a few songs, mentioned a couple of them already, see David's anger coming out, but then, again, looking at the fact that even in his anger, he didn't just put down his pen in writing the song and stomp off and divert his anger from God to someone else, and, well, he did kill someone. But here in these Psalms, how did he work through his anger, and what happened as he worked out that anger, as he kept asking God questions and their songs singing unto, unto him to the chief musician, Psalm 22. And again, it is hard to, to keep our mind, this is going to sound kind of odd, keep our mind away from Christ when we read Messianic Psalms. We search the scriptures that we might find Christ and learn from Christ uh, but it is, it is to the chief musician, and it is a psalm of David, certainly prophetic, certainly messianic, certainly pointing to Calvary. But think of David here and what he's working through, and is he not, at least in part, having a hard time controlling feelings of anger towards God? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God. I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. And then as he's, he's angry, he's frustrated, he doesn't understand what God's allowing in his life. But even there, he continues to, to sing, continues to write, continues to pray, continues to talk to God. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. And then, oh, it's like the emotions take hold. But that was them, and this is me, 
and they were delivered, and I'm not, and so, oh yeah, I'm kind of mad. <laughs> but I'm a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. But as he continues to, to keep the dialogue flowing, keeps talking to God, keeps writing the song, keeps praying, the praises start to come out. Verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Verse 25, my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. So it starts off in just utter despair, but instead of stopping his communication with God, he continues, and then continuing, he starts to remember the goodness of God to his forefathers. Oh, but what about me now? But then he just keeps going, and he eventually gets to the point where he says, well, I will praise you in the congregation, and, and my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. Kept communicating, and it led to praise. Psalm 35, a psalm of David. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Verse 17, Psalm 35. Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions. And everything in between is pretty much, look at my enemies, what they're doing. Uh, Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. Verse 18, I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. And you'd say, well, he's only saying he'll do that if God rescues him. Well, you know, you can continue to read through the Psalms, and I believe you'll continue to find places where David is just frustrated, sorrowful, misunderstanding, and downright angry at God. But he keeps writing, keeps singing, keeps praying, keeps talking to God. And then next thing you know, here's thanksgiving. Here's praise. Here's remembrance of the Holy One. Here's remembrance of past salvation. And he's gaining this experience, as we read in in the two different places, Romans 5 and uh, James chapter 1. Uh, Finally, uh, look in Psalm 13. This will be our last reference from David, and David being our last example, we'll, we'll conclude and get on to our time of prayer. Psalm 13, again, a song to the chief musician, a psalm of David. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemy say, I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. David didn't stop talking to the Lord. David, David's questioning eventually led to his singing and his praising of his Savior, his God. You may find yourself mad at God. Don't stop the dialogue. Don't respond like Cain. Do respond like David. And what about Jonah? We don't know. It just ends with God questioning him. Should not I spare Nineveh? What are your possible responses? No. And I'm going to stay mad at you about it. Anger at God. Guilt and shame withdrawn dialogue, communications with God, despair, depression, cast away from service. That doesn't sound very good. Or in response to, should not I spare Nineveh? Yes, Lord. I don't understand it. I don't understand when Bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people, and they're definitely wicked people. I don't understand it. 
but I accept it. And instead of getting angry with you in the midst of this tribulation in my life, I'll let that work patience, a cheerful endurance, and experience seeing you trustworthy over and over and over again, leading to hope, that confident expectation that you are still in control and you're still just and you still love me and you're still working all things together for good. I don't know if, if that's you right now. I just know at some point in our lives we're all likely to be angry at God, and I pray that the teaching of his word tonight will help us in those situations that it might profit us, but be to his honor and glory, and may he uh, glorify the teaching of his word.